Today I show you how I prep for a session on Dungeon Craft. A number of viewers have asked how I prep for a session, like how do I balance the encounters, what tools do I use, how do I sketch out the plot, so I'm going to do a little bit of that today. As it happens, I'm going to be going to Gen Con in two weeks, I think, from today. And I'm going to be running a number of sessions of a number of games. And so as long as I was preparing them, I said, you know what, let's tape it, put it on Dungeon Craft. So the session I'm going to talk about today is, it's an adaption of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Many of my convention games are adaptions of classic pieces of literature. So, for example, I have Macbeth, which is a version of Macbeth and only I add orcs. I approve it a little bit if I may say so. I think I help Shakespeare reach his full potential. And another game I run is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. So in the past I've run Frankenstein as a 5e game, but this year I'm rebooting it, retooling it, and adapting it for the game Dread. If you're not familiar with this game, instead of dice, conflicts are resolved using a Jenga tower. If your character does something dangerous, you pull a block from the tower. If the tower falls, your character is killed. Game Master quickly rebuilds the tower and the game continues. As the story progresses toward its climax, the tower becomes more rickety and, and it's wobbly and that creates a lot of tension in the game, internal and external tension. So Dread is a great game if you're going to do just a horror one-shot. That would be my preferred game actually, even over Call of Cthulhu. Now for those of you who are not familiar with Mary Shelley's novel, in which this game is based, the main character is Victor Frankenstein. He is a son of a Swiss nobleman and he goes to the University of Ingolstadt in Germany to study medicine. There he becomes obsessed with matters of life and death. He wants to extend life beyond its natural state and also make humans impervious to disease. To do this he creates a creature out of the body parts of dead humans and animals, stitches them together, brings them to life, not with a lightning bolt, but with some sort of chemical, and then all hell breaks loose. In his mind, Victor plans to make it a perfect creature. It's got the strength of ten men, it's got unbelievable constitution, it doesn't suffer from heat or cold, it's impervious to disease. You could shoot it and it's still going to be able to live. The creature's designed to be pretty much invincible, but once Victor brings it to life and realizes how hideous it looks, he runs away and he abandons his creature. Years later, the creature figures out how to read figures out what Victor Frankenstein did, revisits Victor Frankenstein, terrorizes him and his family, and threatens him and says, look, you made me ugly, everyone hates me, everyone tries to kill me everywhere I go, I don't have a single friend in the whole world, it's all your fault. If you make me a mate, I will go off with that mate to the North Pole, you'll never see me again. I pinky swear on it. So Victor, deciding that yes, he's partially responsible, agrees to make the mate. But right before he brings the mate to life, he destroys it. His reasoning is, what if the mate wants children and then tries to overpopulate the world with monster babies? The creature becomes enraged and threatens Victor, I will be with you on your wedding night, and then jumps out the window. And that's pretty much the climax of the book. I mean, you know, they still have the action scene at the end and the falling action. But that's what we need to know about Frankenstein. Also, as I'm doing this, the word Frankenstein, when I'm using it, I'm using it to refer to Victor Frankenstein. The creature is the creature... Frankenstein's the guy that makes the creature. For this episode, I've broken out the big guns, the tweed jacket of insight with my plus one elbow patches. So let's go to the table and I'll show you my thought process using a whiteboard. So here are the characters from the top. Elizabeth Lavenza Frankenstein is Victor Frankenstein's adopted sister and fiance. Ernst Frankenstein is Victor's younger brother. He is um, away at military school. He's training to be a soldier. William Frankenstein. In the book, he's four or five years old. We're going to just do a time jump and have him 15 years old. Henry Clerville is Victor Frankenstein's best friend. Justine Moritz is William Frankenstein's nanny. Now that gives us two female characters and three male characters. And this scenario, in the past, it's, it's attracted a, a large number of female players. So we're going to have a, a gender-fluid character, a coachman or coachwoman. And that's going to be our sixth character. The scenario begins with Elizabeth receiving a note from the dean of the University of Ingolstadt saying that Victor has not attended classes in several months and he is inquiring as to her brother's health. Victor has not written home in several months, which is very disturbing to Elizabeth. She fears something has happened to him. So 
Elizabeth arranges for this party of members of the Frankenstein family and their retainers to investigate. So this is what the adventure looks like. It is called a closed matrix. It looks like a flowchart. Think of the letters as rooms and the arrows as hallways, and it's a dungeon. So once in Ingolstadt, once they arrive, they can go to either the university or Victor's apartment. Now, if they go to the university, they'll meet with the dean, who doesn't know anything more than he's already told them. He suggests they speak to Professors Krimp and Waldman, who taught Victor Frankenstein anatomy, chemistry, and surgery. Those professors are very complimentary as to Victor's abilities. However, they express some concern that Victor was very interested in probing the, the limits of human life, and those are perhaps subjects that should be left to God, which is going to lead the characters to Victor's apartment. So they can either arrive at Victor's apartments first or after the university. And in Victor's apartment, Victor's apartment is located in a courtyard. It's surrounded by buildings. There's a high wall and a gate. In the day, the gate is open. At night, it is always locked by the landlady. It's located in not such a good neighborhood near slaughterhouses. Victor needs to be located near them so he he's, has access to raw materials. So he, they're going to bang on his door and he's going to speak to them through a peephole and tell them to go away, that he wants to be left alone, that it's very dangerous, and he can't tell them why, but he'll contact them in a few days. That will serve to pique their curiosity. Some of the players might want to kick the door down or try to pick the lock. This door is bolted heavily from the inside. There's no way they're getting in. There is, however, in this uh, neighborhood, right across, directly across the street, there's a lodging house where rooms are available on a nightly basis. So the characters can get an apartment and do a stakeout of Victor's apartment from across the street. At 10 o'clock, grave robbers are going to arrive. They're going to pull up by cart by the gate, which is locked. Victor is going to pass them some money through the bars and they will proceed to the graveyard where they're going to break into a mausoleum and steal a young girl's body. So the players have a choice. They can follow the grave robbers to the graveyard or they can continue to watch Victor's house. From the graveyard, the grave robbers will dig up the body, put it in the cart, bring it back to Victor's house, at which point Victor will open the gate, allow them in, and um, they'll carry the body upstairs, then he'll pay them the rest of the money, and they will leave for the day. If they continue following the grave robbers, they go to a tavern. If the players listen, they can overhear the grave robbers saying things like, uh, this guy gives me the creeps, but he, he pays such great money. And what do you think he's doing with all these women? If the characters just watch Victor's house, what they're going to see is, uh, around midnight, a very large figure, uh, man-shaped, but taller than a man could ever be, about eight feet, hops across the rooftops and drops through a skylight into Victor's attic. And he's there about five minutes, then he jumps out and hops again across the rooftops again and disappears. Right? They have just seen Victor's creature. Now, at that point, if they continue to observe, Victor opens the gate and again, that's where the grave robbers deliver the body. What has happened is the creature is demanding that Victor make him a mate, and Victor is in the process of doing so, and every night the, the creature checks on his progress. The players are going to be intrigued. They're going to want to break into Victor's laboratory. Now, how do they do that? Well, it probably has something to do with the grave robbers, right? They could bribe the grave robbers and just pay them double to take their cart, and then Victor will let them in, and they could trick Victor that way. Or, in one game, they the players knock the grave robbers out for some strange reason, and same thing. And another option is just to rent a separate cart, and while the grave robbers, after they've gone about an hour, pull up, and Victor will open thinking it's his grave robbers. Bottom line is the players have to use guile and trickery and do something clever as opposed to banging down the door or picking a lock. So once inside Victor's laboratory, they see, you know, the the Bunsen burners and beakers and, uh, you know, jars of formaldehyde with organs floating in them. And under a sheet in the center is this female body stitched together. And Victor tells them his story, right, that he created this creature several years ago and he intended it to be a, a better version of man. So it is the strength of multiple men and it's faster than a man could ever be and it's impervious to, to disease and it and it, it heals rapidly, it's practically invincible. 
And that was the thing that jumped through the skylight. And this creature is very lonely and is demanding Victor make him a mate. So now the players can do two things. They can either help Victor or they can help the creature. It depends. They may think that Victor is the monster. And that's one of the interesting things about the scenario. No matter what they do, they're going to end up with this encounter, right? where the creature is going to confront a player. The creature is going to surprise one of the players while they're sleeping, clamp its, its hand over their mouth, and will tell its side of the story. And from its point of view, um, Victor abandoned him at birth, hideously disfigured, everyone hates him. He tried to make friends with a peasant family in the forest, and that's how he learned to read, by overseeing them teach their grandchildren. And um, he tried to make friends with them, but they attacked him. Then he rescued a girl from drowning in the woods. Her father shot him. And he has since learned that he is so hideous. Society will never accept him. So Victor owes him a mate. He just wants what everyone else wants, which is love. If Victor makes the mate for the creature, the creature and the mate will disappear in the North Pole and will never be seen again. And the creature vows, I swear to you, for the love of another such as myself, I would make peace with your whole kind. Then he disappears, not harming the character at all. Now the characters are going to have this moral quandary. It often ends up the scenario in a big argument at this point. Who were, whose side are they on? Who is the real monster? Right? And they can go in two paths. They could side with Victor or side with the creature. If they side with Victor, they probably lay an ambush and they wait to attack and from there, two things can happen, right? The creature can get killed, or the creature can flee and get away. Over here, if the players side with the creature and, and say, Victor, you have to make this mate, then at the very last moment, Victor will destroy the mate by throwing acid on it. The creature will think that the players have betrayed him, and it will end up with the creature attacking them, and two things can happen. Either the creature can be killed, or the creature can flee. Just like in the novel, the creature swears he will join Victor on his wedding night. That leads to the wedding at the Frankenstein Chateau. And the honeymoon is going to be this, this lakeside cottage that's just a couple miles away. And uh, it's wintertime, it's snowy. So the characters have two options, right? They can ride with the coach and, and accompany the bride and groom. Or they could go ahead to the cottage. Either way, the creature is going to descend from one of the trees onto the coach and if the character is the coachman, they'll fling the character off. Um, if it's from the cottage, they will already have done so. They'll already fling off the driver. And the creature will take the coach on a wild ride to the lake surface, which is frozen. And once on the ice, the ice will crack and the carriage will fall through and begin to sink. This leads to a tense battle on the ice between the player characters and the creature with the with the ice cracking and spider webbing beneath them and people falling through and the coach is sinking at the same time and they have to rescue Elizabeth and Victor before the coach goes down, all while the Jenga tower is teetering. Now this is called a closed matrix design. Uh, it's a matrix because there are so many different options for the player characters to take, but imagine their own, they're in their own bubbles here, each of these encounters. So you could bounce around in it but eventually you're going here. And then you could bounce all around there and eventually you're going here. So they have a lot of choices, but it comes with limits so that I can predict where they're going to go next. In Dread, the next part of the character design, the characters, um, they're given questions to answer, which they answer on a, a secret sheet, all right? And then they're given to the uh, Game Master and the Game Master weaves it into a story. So things that we could ask, things like, for Elizabeth, why do you still love Victor even though he ignores you? Why did Victor slap you when you were 16? Ernst, what is the dark secret that could get you expelled from military school? William, how long have you been in love with your nanny, Justine? What do you have hidden in your room? Henry, how long have you been in love with Elizabeth? Justine, why haven't you told Henry you're in love with him? What item did you steal from the Frankenstein family and why? And the coachman, how many days has it been since you've gone without a drink? So here we have several dark secrets that could come to light. We have different people in love with each other in conflicting relationships. And that's going to deepen uh, the adventure. I don't know if this stuff is going to come to light, but it's definitely going to be part of the vibe that's, that's going on. 
it'll provide the participants with role-playing opportunities. These aren't the only questions. I'm going to try to think of more that will prove thought-provoking and, and potentially create awkwardness and conflicts. The characters have conflicts with each other. So those internal conflicts as well as the external conflict of the creature. The statistics, that kind of stuff is the last thing I do. I always think in terms of the story and then I think in terms of the characters. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give it the thumbs up. If you have questions or comments, put them below. I'll do my best to answer them. If you like this video, subscribe. And also now you got to click the bell so that you get updates whenever I post a new Dungeon Craft video. This has been Professor Dungeon Master for Dungeon Craft. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you at the table and may all your rolls be 20s. And may this tower not fall over. <laughs>